Who was Justin Martyr? Justin Martyr lived in the second century, about 140, 150 era, where uh, he was a Christian. Now, he grew up, he was a, a Jewish ancestry, but he grew up in a pagan world. Uh, and he studied the philosophers. He studied uh, several Greek philosophers and he ended up uh, um, studying Plato um, and following that route to, uh, to the extreme. And in his uh, search for excellence, he ran into a Christian who told him about the Hebrew scriptures. And the Christian told him that the Hebrew prophets uh, could offer much more than Greek philosophy can. And he ended up reading the Hebrew prophets, and from then on he became a Christian. Now, the time that he became a Christian was the time when Christians were praying or gathering in homes or gathering in the catacombs. Um, they, uh, Christianity was pretty much illegal. It wasn't that um, the Romans went after Christians constantly, per se, but what Christians believed was illegal. That is not, um, not serving Roman gods. Because in a pagan society, if you're not serving the gods and there's some disaster, then you are the reason for the disaster. Gods would be vengeful against those who do not serve them. And Rome had uh, a whole set of um, systems in place to appease all of the gods. And everybody had to go along to get along. So Christians uh, refused to serve uh, or to recognize pagan gods. And they also refused to worship the emperor as a god. And for that, they would be put to death. Um, many of them were beheaded. And it got to a point during that era where they had a card you you would like a license um, that would uh, prove that you have offered incense to the Emperor you would get that card and Christians um, would be found out by, by not having that card so um, this is the time that Justin Martyr lived. And so he, he is a, a rare picture for us to see, okay, after the, there was the, the disciples of Jesus after he rose from the dead, and then there was a second generation of disciples. We have a bit of writings from them. And then there's a third generation of disciples. And this would be uh, Justin Martyr's time but Justin Martyr doesn't actually name off any school that he went to as Christians or any particular disciple that he followed. Um, he seemed to be someone that more read the scriptures himself and spoke to people and devised his theology from there. And Justin Martyr, what he's famous for today is ma mainly three books that scholars tend to all agree that are attributed to him. There's there are two apologies written to the Roman Senate and also one other book, Justin's Dialogue with Trifo. There are some other books that are attributed to him, but they're uh, considered spurious and and or or scholars will disagree whether that actually was him um, but those three are pretty much uh, his books 
Now, the, the, the two apologies to the Roman Senate, he was defending Christians. He wrote these letters to the Roman Senate uh, asking for leniency towards Christians because, um, you know, he's giving all the reasons. There was a lot of false um, narratives out there about Christians and he was giving, uh, first of all, shutting down those false narratives and he was also ta talking about Christians, what they really do and what they really believe. And he was asking the Roman Senate to give Christians uh, the right to practice their own religion because they are good citizens and honest people, hardworking people, and that they are actually good for Rome and they should not be killed. And um, he wrote um, his first apology uh, brought a relaxing of the persecution but then uh, a new emperor came along and the persecution got stronger and he wrote his second apology and that brought him before the uh, court or the magistrate and he ended up being beheaded for refusing to comply um, that's why he he obtained the last name Martyr, Justin Martyr, or Justin the Martyr. So we're going to start looking at his first apology, and, and there's a, a lot to learn about early Christianity from him. It's, it's the time before Rome accepted Christianity, and the, and, and the Council of Nice and the Nicene Creed happened. It was before that. But after the disciples had all uh, pretty much passed away. And so he was a defender of the faith in that time of, it's a, like a dark period in Christian history. Um, he's one of the very few that, that stand out. And he talks a lot about Christians at that time. And what we must understand about Christianity at that time was they did not all believe the same thing um, exactly. And they did not all know each other. And there was no established organization. It was m groups of organizations scattered about um, and meeting in secret. And Justin Martyr apparently had gone to some of these groups. And he... Uh, Maybe he did belong to one of them groups, but he wasn't going to expose that group to the Roman government. So there's that. But we learn a lot about what Christians are really like from his letters. So let's get started. We're going to look at um, Justin Martyr's first apology. Uh, this is his first letter to the Roman Senate, which uh, is about 140. AD. All right, so this is a the newadvent.org website. It's a Roman Catholic website. Um, I'm definitely not Roman Catholic, but this is a pretty good place if you want to find some uh, old documents. Uh, from early Christianity. So this here is Justin Martyr's first apology. Okay, chapter 1. To the Emperor Titus Aelius Adri Adrianus, Antonius Pius Augustus Caesar, and to his son Verissimus the philosopher, and to Lucius the philosopher, the natural son of Caesar, and the adopted son of Pius, a lover of learning, and to the sacred senate, with the whole people of the Romans, I, Justin, son of Priscus, and grandson of Bacchius, natives of Flavia, Neapolis, in Palestine, 
present this address and petition on behalf of those of all nations who are unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. Reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what is true. Declining. Now, you can see here he is, uh, the, these Roman emperor and his son are, are philosophers. And so here he is uh, appealing to philosophy. Okay. Reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what is true, declining to follow traditional opinions, if these be worthless. For not only does sound reason direct us to refuse the guidance of those who did or taught anything wrong, but it is incumbent on the lover of truth by all means, and if death be threatened, even before his own life, to choose and do and say what is right. Do you then, since you are called pious and philosophers, guardians of justice and lovers of learning, give good heed and hearken to my address. If you are indeed such, it will be manifested. For we have come not to flatter you by this writing, nor please you by our address, but to beg that you pass judgment after an accurate and searching investigation, not flattered by prejudice or by a desire of pleasing superstitious men, nor induced by irrational impulse or evil rumors, which have long been prevalent, to give a decision which will prove against yourselves. For as for us, we reckon that no evil can be done us unless we be convicted as evildoers or be proved to be wicked men and you can kill but not hurt us. Now that reflects back to Jesus saying, Do not be afraid of him who can kill the body, but be afraid of him who can kill the soul in hell. Right? Okay, so... Chapter 3, Claim of Judicial Investigation. But, a, but lest anyone think that this is an unreasonable and reckless utterance, we demand that the charges against the Christians be investigated, and that if these be substantiated, they will be punished as they deserve, or rather indeed, we ourselves will punish them. But if no one can convict us of anything, true reason forbids you, for the sake of a wicked rumor, to wrong blameless men, and indeed rather yourselves, who think fit to direct affairs, not by judgment, but by passion. And every sober-minded person will declare this to be the only fair and equitable adjustment, namely, that the subjects render an unexceptional account of their own life and doctrine, and that on the other hand, the rulers should give their decision in obedience, not to violence and tyranny, but to piety and philosophy. For thus would both rulers and ruled reap benefit. For even one of the ancients somewhere said, unless both rulers and ruled philosophize, it is impossible to make states blessed. It is our task, therefore, to afford to an all to all an opportunity of inspecting our life and teachings, lest on account of those who are accustomed to, the, to be ignorant of our affairs, that w we should incur the penalty due to them for mental blindness. And it is your business, when you hear us, to be found, as reason demands, good judges. For if when you have learned the truth, you do not what is just, you will be before God without excuse. So now he's, he's still appealing to them as philosophers to go with what is just and true and right and not with passion and to uh, not judge Christians without first hearing 
their defense. So now he's going to start with their defense. Chapter 4. By the mere application of a name, nothing is decided, either good or evil, apart from the actions implied in the name. And indeed, so far at least as one may judge from the name we are accused of, we are most excellent people. But as we do not think it is just to beg to be acquitted on account of the name, if we be convicted as evildoers, so, on the other hand, if we be found to have committed no offense, either in the matter of thus naming ourselves, or of our conduct as citizens, it is your part very earnestly to guard against incurring just punishment by unjustly punishing those who are not convicted. For from a name neither praise nor punishment could reasonably spring, unless something excellent or base in action be proved. And those among yourselves who are accused, you do not punish before they are convicted. But in our case, you receive the name as proof against us. And this, although, so far as the name goes, you ought rather to punish our accusers. For we are accused of being Christians, and to hate what is excellent, Christian, is unjust. Again, if any of the accused deny the name and say that he is not a Christian, you acquit him as having no evidence against him as a wrongdoer. But if anyone acknowledges that he is a Christian, you punish him on account of this acknowledgement. Justice requires that you inquire into the life both of him who confesses and of him who denies that by his deeds it may be apparent what kind of a man each is. For as some who have been taught by the Master, Christ, do not deny him, give encouragement to others when they are put to the question, so in all probability do those who lead wicked lives give occasion to those who, without consideration, take upon them to accuse all the Christians of impiety and wickedness. So he's saying wicked people will start accusing people of being Christians just to get them killed. And this also is not right, for out of philosophy, too, some assume the name and the garb who do nothing worthy of their profession, and you are well aware that those of the ancients whose opinions and teachings were quite diverse, are yet all called by one name, philosophers. And of these, some taught atheism, and the poets who have flourished among you raise a laugh out of the uncleanness of Jupiter with his own children. So the stories about the god Jupiter with his own children is laughable. And those who now adopt such instruction are not restrained by you, but on the, on the contrary, you bestow prizes and honors upon those who euphoniously insult the gods. Because they laugh at Jupiter and what he does with his children. Chapter 5. Why then should this be? In our case, who pledge ourselves to do no wickedness, nor to hold these atheistic opinions, you do not examine the charges made against us, but yielding to unreasoning passion and to the instigation of evil demons, you punish us without consideration or judgment. For the truth shall be spoken, since of old, these evil demons, affecting apparitions of themselves, both defiled women and corrupted boys, and showed such fearful sights to men, that those who, do, who did not use their reason in judging, and of the actions that were done, were struck with terror, and being carried away by fear, and not knowing that these were demons, they called them gods, 
and gave to each the name which each of the demons chose for himself. So this is, he's talking about where the pagan gods came from in the first place. And when Socrates endeavored by true reason and examination to bring these things to light and deliver men from the demons, then the demons themselves, by means of men who rejoiced in iniquity, compassed his death as an atheist and a profane person on the charge that he was introducing new divinities. And in our case, they display a similar activity. For not only among the Greeks did reason, the Logos, prevail to condemn these things through Socrates, but also among the barbarians were they condemned by reason, or the Word, the Logos himself, who took shape and became a man and was called Jesus Christ, and in obedience to him, we not only deny that they who did such things as these are gods, but assert that they are wicked and impious demons, whose actions will not bear comparison with those even of men desirous of virtue. Interesting. So what Justin is talking about here is quite interesting. Um, this is uh, this comes out of the book of Enoch. Uh, the first book of Enoch you'll find, we studied it once before, early in this channel, um, where Enoch talks, talks about a time when the uh, angels of God who were guardians upon earth ended up mating with human women and creating uh, their children came out as giants and these are the giants that appear in the Old Testament who fought against Joshua and Moses um, and David and Goliath the giant so these giants because they were spawned from eternal beings when they die their spirit is eternal and God determined that they should be called the terrestrial spirits and that they thirst eternally and that they uh, wreak havoc in the earth. They, they um, tempt men and create um, sin and the, when, when these um, giants, you see, they, they, they were sitting upon the earth. A lot of them sat upon the earth as gods, as living gods, um, because they were so large and strong. And they demanded that people bring them gifts. And they brought them food. And they had an insatiable appetite. And uh, they, they were fed and taken care of by the little people. And um, when these giants died, there was an idol made, or an image made to them. And the image was given the name of the giant that died. And this is where the uh, pagan deities began. And that the people, the priests kind of created this little cult where they would get the goods that were being brought to the the, the uh, image or the idol and this is something that God has always been very much opposed to uh, for various reasons and um, so this is what Justin is talking about in his day he's saying the Greco-Roman deities are actually demons and that these demonic spirits are actually operating behind these idols and behind these systems of idol worship. And he's saying that it's completely de demonic. And you could even uh, support that with the writing of Paul, who said that those who offer, offer sacrifices to idols 
are offering sacrifices to demons. So, um, Jesus and the apostles, you see, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, which is very in keeping with uh, prophecies in the book of Enoch. And he never actually quoted Enoch, per se, but he never spoke against it either. And uh, some of his disciples quoted Enoch directly, like Jude. Uh, I think Jude quotes Enoch directly. And there's one other, I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, the book of Enoch was quite popular in those days. There, there was the Hebrew Bible, but there were other books floating around that some of the apostles read and uh, Jesus was probably quite familiar with. John the Baptist, he may have been uh, associated with the Dead Sea cult. Uh, there's a lot of things going on there that we're just starting to really figure out now. In, since the Dead Sea Scroll discoveries. So it's pretty interesting stuff. So Justin Martyr, he's quite vocal about this, that the pagan gods are really demons. And um, you'll hear him speak about this a few more times, where uh, those who serve them are serving demons. Well, back to our reading. So he's attacking, still attacking Jupiter and other gods. So now, chapter 6. Hence we are called atheists, and we confess that we are atheists, so far as the gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the most true God, the Father of righteousness and temperance and other virtues, who is free from all impurity. But both him and the Son, who came forth from him and taught us these things, and the host of the other good angels who follow and are made like him, and the prophetic spirit we worship and adore, knowing them in reason and truth, and declaring without grudging to everyone who wishes to learn as we have been taught. But some will say, some have ere now been arrested and convicted as evildoers, for you condemn many, many a time, after inquiring into the life of each of the accused severally, but not on account of those whom, he, whom we have been speaking not when it comes to Christians. And this we acknowledge, that as among the Greeks, those who teach such theories as please themselves are called by the one name philosopher, though their doctrines be diverse. So also among the barbarians, this name on which accusations are accumulated as the common property of those who are those who seem wise. So they are also called philosophers. For all are called Christians. Wherefore we demand that the deeds of all those who are accused to you be judged in order that each one who is convicted may be punished as an evildoer and not as a Christian. For it if it is clear to and if it is clear that any one is blameless, that he may be acquitted, since by the mere fact of his being a Christian, he does no wrong. For we will not require that you punish our accusers, they being sufficiently punished by their present wickedness and ignorance of what is right. Okay, so don't punish us for being Christians punish us for doing wrong. Now, chapter 8. And reckon that it is for your sakes we have been saying these things, for it is in our power when we are examined 
to deny that we are Christians, but we would not live by telling a lie. For impelled by the desire of the eternal and pure life, we seek the abode that is with God, the Father and Creator of all, and hasten to confess our faith. So we're in a hurry to confess we're Christians because we get out of here and go to God. Persuaded and convinced as we are that they who have proved to God by their works that they followed him and love to abide with him where there is no sin to cause disturbance can obtain these things. This then, to speak shortly, is what we expect and have learned from Christ and teach. And Plato, in like manner, used to say that Radamanthus and Minos would punish the wicked who came before them, and we say that the same thing will be done, but at the hand of Christ, and upon the wicked, in the same bodies united again to their spirits, which are now to undergo everlasting punishment, and not only, as Plato said, for a, per for a period of a thousand years, so Plato, Plato said for a thousand years, but we say it's everlasting. And if anyone says that this is incredible or impossible, this error of ours is one which concerns ourselves only, and no other person, so long as you cannot convict us of doing any harm. You can't convict us of, for just believing something. Folly of idol worship, chapter 9. And neither do we honor with many sacrifices and garlands of flowers such deities as men have formed and set in shrines and called gods, since we see that these are soulless and dead and have not the form of God. For we do not consider that God has such a form as some say that they imitate to this honor but have the names and forms of those wicked demons which they have appeared. For, for why need we tell you who already know into what forms the craftsmen? So now they're putting in here what, what uh, Bible verses you can look at. The craftsmen carving and cutting and casting and hammering fashion the materials and often out of vessels of dishonor by merely changing the form and making an image of the requisite shape, they make what they call a god, which we consider not only senseless, but to be even insulting to God, who, having ineffable glory and form, thus gets his name attached to things that are corruptible and require constant service and that the artificers of these are both intemperate and not to enter into particulars, are practice in every vice, you very well know. Even their own girls who work along with them they corrupt. What infatuation that dissolute men should be said to fashion and make gods for your worship, and that you should appoint such men the guardians of the temples, where they are enshrined, not recognizing that it is unlawful even to think or say that men are the guardians of the gods. How God should be served. But we have received by tradition that God does not need the material offerings which men can give, seeing indeed that he himself is the provider of all things. And we have been taught and are convinced and do believe that he accepts those only who imitate the excellences which reside in him, temperance and justice and philanthropy, and as many virtues as are peculiar to a God who is called by no proper name. And we have been taught that he in the beginning did of his goodness for man's sake create all things out of unformed matter. And if men by their works show themselves worthy of, the, of this, his design, they are deemed worthy, 
and so we have received of reigning in company with him, being delivered from corruption and suffering. For as in the beginning he created us when we were not, so do we consider that in like manner those who choose what is pleasing to him are, on account of their choice, deemed worthy of incorruption and of fellowship with him. For the coming into being at first was not in our own power, and in order that we may follow those things which please him, choosing them by means of the rational faculties he has himself endowed us with, he both persuades us and leads us to faith. And we think it for the advantage of all men that they are not restrained from learning these things, but are even urged thereunto. For the restraint which human laws could not affect, the word, inasmuch as he is divine, would have affected, had not the wicked demons, taking as their ally the lust of wickedness, which is in every man, and which draws variously to all manner of vice, scattered many false and profane accusations, none of which attached to us. What Christians look for. And when you hear that we look for a kingdom, you suppose without making any inquiry that we speak of a human kingdom, whereas we speak of that which is with God, as appears also from the confession of their faith made by those who are charged with being Christians. Though they know that death is the punishment awarded to him who so confesses, so, so, for if we look for a human kingdom, we should also deny our Christ that we might not be slain, and we should strive to escape detection that we might obtain what we expect. But since our thoughts are not fixed on the present, we are not concerned when men cut us off or kill us since also death is a debt which must at all events be paid. Christians live as under God's eye. And more than all other men are we your helpers and allies in promoting peace, seeing that we hold this view that it is alike impossible for the wicked, the covetous, the conspirator, and the virtuous and for the virtuous to escape the, no to escape the notice of God, and that each man goes to everlasting punishment or salvation according to the value of his actions. For if all men knew this, no one would choose wickedness even for a little, knowing that he goes to the everlasting punishment of fire, but would by all means restrain himself and adorn himself with virtue, that he might obtain the good gifts of God and escape the punishments. For those who, on account of the laws and punishments you impose, endeavor to escape detection when they offend, and they offend too under the impression that it is quite possible to escape your detection, since you are but men, those persons, if they learned and were convinced that nothing whether actually done or only intended, can escape the knowledge of God, would by all means live decently on account of the penalties threatened, even as you yourselves will admit. But, seem, but you seem to fear lest all men become righteous, and you no longer have any to punish. Such would be the concern of public executioners, but not of good princes. But as we before said, we are persuaded that these things are prompted by evil spirits who demand sacrifices and service even from those who live unreasonably. But as for you, we presume that you, who aim at a reputation for piety and philosophy, will do nothing unreasonable. But if you also, like the foolish, prefer custom to truth, do what you have the power to do, 
but just so much power have rulers who esteem opinion more than truth as robbers have in a desert, and that you will not succeed is declared by the word, then whom, after God, who begot him, we know there is no ruler more kingly and just. For as all shrink from succeeding to the poverty or sufferings or obscurity of their fathers, so whatever the word forbids us to choose, the sensible man will not choose, that all these things should come to pass. I say, our teacher foretold, he who is both son and apostle of God, the Father, and of all, the, of all, he is both son and apostle of God, the Father of all, and ruler, Jesus Christ, from whom also we have the name Christians, whence we become more assured of all the things he taught us, since whatever he beforehand told should come to pass is seen in fact coming to pass, and this is the work of God, to tell of a thing before it happens, and as it was foretold, so to show it happening. It were possible to pause here and add no more, reckoning that we demand what is just and true, but because we are well aware that it is not easy suddenly to change a mind possessed by ignorance, we intend to add a few things for the sake of persu persuading those who love the truth, knowing that it is not impossible to put ignorance to flight by presenting the truth. Christians serve God rationally. What sober-minded man, then, will not acknowledge that we are not atheists, worshipping as we do the maker of this universe, and declaring, as we have been taught, that he has no need of streams of blood and libations and incense, whom we praise to the utmost of our power by the exercise of prayer and thanksgiving for all things, wherewith we are supplied. As we have been taught that the only honor that is worthy of him is not to consume by fire what he has brought into being for our sustenance, but to use it for ourselves and those who need, and with gratitude to him to offer thanks by invocations and hymns for our creation and for all the means of health and for the various qualities of the different kinds of things, and for the changes of the seasons, and to present before him petitions for our existing again in incorruption through faith in him. Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, who also was born for this purpose, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, Pro curator of Judea in the times of Tiberius Caesar, and that we reasonably worship him, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, and holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third. We will prove, for they proclaim our madness to consist in this, that we give to a crucified man a place second to the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of all. For they do not discern the mystery that is herein, to which, as we make it plain to you, we pray you to give heed. Okay, so here we go. He's getting going to get deep into Christian theology pretty soon. The, de the demons misrepresent Christian doctrine. For we fore forewarn you to be on your guard, lest those demons who, whom we have been accusing should deceive you, and quite divert you from reading and understanding what we say. For they strive to hold you their slaves and servants, and sometimes by appearance in dreams, and sometimes by magical impositions, they subdue all who make no strong opposing effort, for their own salvation. And thus do we also, since our persuasion by the word stand aloof from them.
and the demons, and follow the only unbegotten God through his Son. We who formerly delighted in fornication, but now embrace chastity, chastity alone. <clears throat> For we formerly used magical arts. We who formerly used magical arts dedicate ourselves to the good and unbegotten God. We who valued above all things the acquisition of wealth and possessions now bring what we have into a common stock and communicate to everyone in need. We who hated and destroyed one another and on account of their different manners would not live with men of a different tribe, now, since the coming of Christ, live familiarly with them and pray for our enemies and, and endeavor to persuade those who hate us unjustly to live comfortably to the good precepts of Christ, to the end that they may become partakers with us of the same joyful hope of a reward from God, the ruler of all. But lest we should seem to be reasoning sophistically, we consider it right before giving you the promised explanation to cite a few precepts given by Christ himself and be it yours as powerful rulers to inquire whether we have been taught and do teach these things truly. Brief and concise utterances fell from him, for he has no sophist, but his word was the power of God. Okay, what Christ himself taught. Concern, concerning chastity, he uttered such sentiments as these. Whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed all adultery with her already in his heart before God. And if your right eye offend you, cut it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into everlasting fire. And whoever shall marry her that is divorced from another husband commits adultery. And there are some who have been made eunuchs of men, and some who were born eunuchs, and some who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. But all cannot receive this saying. So that's all Matthew, right? So that all who by human law are twice married are in the eye of our master sinners. And those who look upon a woman to lust after her, for not only he who in act commits adultery is rejected by him, but also he who desires to commit adultery, since not only our works, but also our thoughts are open before God, and many both men and women who have been Christ's disciples from childhood remain pure at the age of 60 or 70 years. And I boast that I could produce such from every race of men. For what shall I say too of the countless multitude of those who have reformed in temperate habits and learn these things? For Christ called not just nor the chaste, to repentance, but to the ungodly and the licentious and the unjust, his words being, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. For the heavenly Father desires rather the repentance than the punishment of the sinner. And of our love to all he taught thus, If you love them that love you, what new thing are you doing? For even fornicators do this. But I say to you, pray for your enemies, and love them that hate you, and bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. That's found in Matthew and Luke. And that we should communicate to the needy, and do nothing for glory. He said, give to him that asks, and from him that would borrow, turn not away. 
For if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what new thing are you doing? Even the publicans do this. Lay not up your, for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where robbers break through, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupts. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for it? Lay up treasure therefore in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt. And be kind and merciful, as your Father also is kind and merciful, and makes his Son to rise on sinners and the righteous and the wicked. Take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall put on. Are you better than the birds and the beasts? God feeds them. Take no thought, therefore, what you shall eat or what you shall put on, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added to you. For where his treasure is, there also is the mind of a man. Do not those things to be seen of men, otherwise you have no reward from your Father which is in heaven. That's pretty hardcore Christianity, isn't it? Okay, concerning patience and swearing. And concerning our being patient of injuries and ready to serve all and free from anger, this is what he said. To him that smites you on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that takes away your cloak or your coat, forbid not. And whoever shall be anger, angry is in danger of the fire. And everyone that compels you to go with him a mile, follow him too. And let your good works shine before men, that they, seeing them, may glorify your Father which is in heaven. For we ought not to strive, neither has he desired us to be imitators of wicked men, but he has exhorted us to lead all men by patience and gentleness from shame and love of evil. And this indeed is proved in the case of many who once were of your way of thinking, but have changed their violent and tyrannical disposition, being overcome either, either by the constancy which they have witnessed in their neighbors' lives, or by the extraordinary forbearance they have observed in their fellow travelers when defrauded or by the honesty of those with whom they have transacted business. And with regard to our not swearing at all, they do not swear at all, and always speaking the truth, he enjoined as follows, Swear not at all, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, for whatever is more than these comes of evil. And that we ought to worship God alone, he thus persuaded us. The greatest commandment is you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve with all your heart and with all your strength, the Lord God that made you. And when a certain man came to him and said, Good Master, he answered and said, There is none good but God only who made all things. And let those who are not found living as he taught be understood to be no Christians. Even though they profess with the lip the precepts of Christ, for not those who make profession, but those who do the works shall be saved according to his word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. For whoever hears me and does my sayings, hears him that sent me, and many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not eaten and drunk in your name and done wonders? Then I will say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Then shall there be wailing and gnashing of teeth, when the righteous shall shine as the sun, and the wicked are sent into everlasting fire. For many shall come in my name, 
clothed outwardly in sheep's clothing, but inwardly being ravening wolves. But their works, by their works you shall know them. And every tree that brings not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And as those who are not living pursuant to these his teachings, and are Christians only in name, we demand that all such be punished by you. Okay, we'll wrap it up for part one today. Um, I found that pretty uh, revealing and exciting. It, it does uh, bring up a lot of thoughts. It's very thought-provoking to think. Uh, we have to remember that th this wasn't all early Christians. Um, because uh, Christians were in hiding, you'll see that there were different groups who had slightly different modifications of interpreting the gospel and how to live by it. And this was, uh, it seems like Justin was in, involved with some particular group and how they viewed it. And it's quite interesting. They will see they lived in a communal relationship. That's where everybody brought everything they owned and they lived in a group. Um, they were also completely celibate, um, and they uh, taught that uh, your first marriage is your only marriage, and you cannot get divorced and marry again. Also, uh, about swearing an oath, do not swear oaths at all, which is what Jesus said because you cannot change one hair on your head. I don't know how they get married without swearing an oath. I guess uh, they did it in those days. Um, and being completely anger free. Um, I guess if you're worry free, it's easier to be anger free. Um, but it does make you sit back and think on how we live today and how how they lived in those times now being completely celibate i think in those times it was a more important perhaps because there was a lot of um open sexuality especially a, a surrounding temple worship where there were temple prostitutes and it was quite common to just go there and do your thing and um, it wasn't considered uh, anything unusual so uh, complete celibacy would be an open stand against that kind of practice maybe today it would be equally an open stand um, it, to me it seems um, quite uh, erratic or radical uh, in those days, there were some, even some famous, um, who castrated themselves for Christ, that they could live celibate. Um, that sounds completely radical to me, but in those days, it was uh, not uncommon to hear of that. So, um it just uh, helps us to sort of say, well, that was in the first 150 years of Christianity, how they reacted to the message. Um, and maybe it helps us to adjust how we react to the message. And maybe we don't have to be quite so radical, but maybe more radical than we are. Um, I could say that. Now, Justin is a very good study. He's just getting started here. He reveals many, many things about uh, the early Christians, or at least the ones that he knew. And uh, the ones that he knew would not be all that far off from the general norm of Christians. Um, they were how devoted and dedicated they were and how they did not fear death. They actually welcomed it. 
especially being beheaded for the name of Christ. That would be like the greatest opportunity because it's undeniable that you died for Christ. So you're definitely in with Christ. You're definitely following him, in other words. So to them it was a great opportunity, to a lot of them. Now there were many Christians who denied um, Christ when it came up to uh, offering incense to the emperor. They did it to get away from being killed. And uh, Justin had rather harsh words for them that uh, they were uh, Christians in name only. Um, when it came right down to it, they didn't have what it took. And uh, after the persecutions ended, that was one of the first controversies on whether they would let those Christians back into the fold. Um, generally speaking, they did let them back into the fold. Uh, forgiveness was paramount above punishing them for not having the courage. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed that as well as, as much as I did. And we will see you next week. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, uh, help out the video. And we'll see you next week.